We have a lot of breaking news coming in this hour. We'll keep you updated on all the latest. But for now, the Republican National Convention, we're here. It's officially underway here in Milwaukee. This is we're tracking a presidential race that has seen a dramatic shift in the past 72 hours. No one could have predicted it. First, former President Trump, he's expected to announce his vice presidential pick at any moment. We've all been waiting. We'll bring you the context clues as we get them. And we're about to find out who will join the ticket. We've been asking that question for so long. Today is the day. Also breaking, a judge has tossed out former President Trump's federal classified documents case, ruling that special counsel Jack Smith should never have been appointed. We have a live report coming up. And the unprecedented backdrop for all of this, the assassination attempt on former President Trump. New developments on the investigation and what the shooter was doing just hours before he climbed on top of that building and fired. This is Outnumbered. I'm Kaylee McEnany here with my co-host, Harris Faulkner and Emily Campagno. Also joining us, former State Department spokesperson and founder of Polaris National Security, Morgan Ortegas, and former Biden campaign surrogate, Kevin Walling. But first, let's go to CB Cotton. She's live in Butler, Pennsylvania, with the latest on the investigation. CB. Hi, Kaylee. Good afternoon. This is the rooftop where federal agents say Thomas Matthew Crooks tried to assassinate former President Donald Trump. The rally was taking place where you can see that American flag blowing in the distance. It's only about 200 yards away from where we are standing. This is now an active crime scene. We are being kept away from the immediate area. But throughout the morning, we've seen state and federal agents coming and going. We've also learned that the shooter reportedly purchased 50 rounds of ammunition and the hours before this tragedy. Federal law enforcement sources tell us it was local law enforcement who had responsibility for securing the rooftop. It was rally goers who first spotted the gunmen crawling on top of the building. Sources tell us one officer climbed to the top of the roof, saw crooks armed with a rifle and retreated. Soon after that, crooks began to fire, according to the source. And we know moments later, a Secret Service counter sniper shot and killed the gunman. Our federal sources tell us they're still trying to access the shooter's phone as they try to learn what may have motivated him. Bomb making materials found inside the shooter's home and car have been shipped to the FBI's lab in Quantico. We've learned a social media profile the shooter had on Discord has also now been removed, according to a statement, which reads, quote, we have identified an account that appears to be linked to the suspect and we removed the account according to our off platform behavior policy. It was rarely utilized, has not been used in months, and we have found no evidence that, that it was used to plan this incident, promote violence or discuss his political views. Today, we saw the FBI agents around the shooter's home talking to neighbors, going door to door down the block. I knew, I knew it was my neighbor when we were told we had to leave our house. The Secret Service now pushing back against criticisms over its handling of security for this rally and the Secret Service director saying she's committed to working with both state and federal agents to make sure something like this never happens again. Kaylee. CB, thank you. You know, Emily, I, I want to back up for a moment and, you know, talk about something that was kind of overlooked, but it's something that President Trump said to Brett Baer. And I confirmed with Brett the quote that President Trump shared with him. And here's what President Trump said. There's a lot of talk about what could have been done to get the shooter, a lot of questions, but the guys around me did a fantastic job. I talked to a, a senior law enforcement official who is retired, who is familiar with presidential protection. And what he told me was the counter sniper neutralized the threat in three seconds. So seven heroic agents who jumped on top of him did just what they should have done, bringing him beneath the pipe and drape where there is an armor in front of him. So a lot of questions, we don't have all the answers, but there were some people who acted quite heroically that day. That's right, Kelly. And later in the show, we have the honor of having a former supervisory agent, Jeff James, presidential detail for many decades there, join us. And we're going to pick his brain a little bit about those operations. I want to point out as well that recall among the first things out of President Trump's mouth 
after that attempted assassination was to express that gratitude for those brave men and women who have sworn to protect him at all costs, even if it means sacrificing their lives. And that level of gratitude in the, in the face of what can only be, I'm sure, um, extreme shock and is, is, is really commendable because that shows where his mindset is. To your point, I, I can't think of anyone who watched this unfold uh, without such agitation and fear and shock and dismay. And there, by the grace of God, President Trump is still standing before us because, frankly, what we see, it's splitting hairs in time. He just slightly shifted his face, and that is why the bullet only grazed his ear. That is a miracle at a minimum, Kaylee. It is a miracle. Uh, Providence comes to mind. You know, he clearly had Christ protecting him in that mo moment. Morgan, you've been to a lot of rallies like I have. Um, you know how this works as well. There is no doubt that there was a failure, and we will figure out where that failure happened, where it occurred. However, it's important for our viewers to understand, at a rally, there's a, an inner perimeter, a middle perimeter, an outer perimeter. Inside the perimeter, when you get past the magnometers, Secret Service controls that area. Outside of that perimeter is local law enforcement, which Secret Service has to rely on in some respect. Um, this senior law enforcement official said he believes the investigation will reveal that it was indeed local law enforcement in charge of that building, as CB Cotton sources are telling her as well. Um, and another question, a huge question, is what assets did Secret Service request? What was accepted? What was denied? And where did that breakdown happen? Yeah, that's all right, Kaylee. First of all, I've been to a lot of these rallies. I've been with you. It's fun watching people uh, take selfies with you. You're always a big hit at, at those rallies. Mm -hmm. Immediately when I saw this, I thought about the many times I've been with Mike Pompeo and had diplomatic security, the times we've been with the president. And I just want to reiterate what Emily said. It's so important. I would always look around at the Secret Service or the diplomatic security and know that these men and women would be willing to take a bullet for the principal and for all of us if needed. I'm so grateful for that because everybody in that picture protecting President Trump uh, was somebody who had a wife, a mother, uh, children, spouses, husbands. You know, it, it, they all had family that watched uh, them put themselves in harm's way in real time. When you start to talk, though, about the physical security, you know, of the rally, there are a lot of important questions that have to be answered. You just laid them out, so I'm not going to reiterate all of them, Kaylee. I think you laid them out perfectly. And this is why you're seeing Congress call for this head of the Secret Service, the head of DHS to to come forward and testify because it's not just about former President Trump. It's also about the Secret Service for our sitting president, for the first ladies. And I would remind everybody, I've been saying this on Outnumbered for three years, and unfortunately, I'm going to have to reiterate this again. The Iranian regime has active threats against President Trump and his former cabinet members, and our enemies saw those vulnerabilities on Saturday, so it has to be fixed. Harrison, you sat down with President Trump, and he goes off, and, and no one expected anything like this to happen. No. And then, you know, there was talk of, is the RNC canceled? Is he still going to show up? He, he came. He made it on time, despite all of this. It's really remarkable. Well, he didn't just show the nation that we are all capable, capable of amazing resilience by raising his hand in that iconic fashion, that fist, blood streaming down his face, and getting out the word fight. He did that, yes, but he also showed us that we're capable of so much more. I mean, he kept going. He played golf. He, he went to the thing reflexively that soothes him that he loves at Bedminster, a beautiful place, another beautiful place where he lives. He reminded us that it, there is more than this political fight that we're in in this moment. There is the reason why we're in it that we need to focus on, and that is that America has got to be better than what it is right now. I want to share something with you that I've been thinking about the assassination attempt, uh, as we call it, on Donald Trump's life. I, I call the shooter an assassin because he did kill someone that day. An American yes. citizen who went to a rally to see if maybe his beliefs would start to come out of a candidate's mouth and that would be the person that he would vote for. The reason why everybody goes to a rally. Mm -hmm. Is this the person I've been cheering for? Is he worth my vote? Blah, blah, blah. Taken out in front of his family. Mm -hmm. And I know Governor Jen, uh, Glenn Youngkin last hour was recognizing Corey and his family. But also you have two people who are hospitalized. Their conditions upgraded to stable now. 
He was an assassin. There was an assassination. It just was not, thankfully, the president, but it was someone's dad, someone's husband, yeah. and we must not forget that. So, yes, the FBI classifies it as an assassination attempt, but I've been thinking about that. Yeah, Corey Comparatore, a father of two, shielding his daughter, an absolute hero, a firefighter. He attended church every week, an upstanding member of his community, and he lost his life to this gunman. You know, Kevin, right behind me, at some point, we are going to have an enormous moment when President Trump walks on that stage. Everyone wanting to see him. We don't know what his ear is going to look like. We don't know optically, you know, what he's going to look like, but he is going to exude strength, and it will be quite a moment. I'm going to predict that moment happens tonight, but we'll see. Your thoughts, Kevin? I think it's going to be an incredible moment. Kaylee, to your point, there by the grace of God, uh, the former president's life was saved. You know, I, I, it was such a remarkable uh, uh, thing to see the president uh, come up from that attack, fist raised in the hand, uh, his hands raised, as, as uh, Harris just talked about. Um, and, and the fact that, you know, to Harris's point, too, this was a murder scene. This man <clears throat> lost his life. We, we want an engaged citizenry. Uh, we want people showing up. We want people knocking on doors, going to rallies, engaging in the political process. And as the, the President Biden said, that spot at that dinner table will for, forever be uh, mm -hmm. gone because uh, of this assassin's uh, bullet. Uh, so this is a horrific event. Uh, I am so encouraged by uh, what the former president has said publicly in his interviews and in his tweets calling for unity. Uh, I think this is a real moment. The former president, the president spoke. The first lady and the former first lady spoke. Hopefully we can continue to have that atmosphere. Uh, uh, proceed in the next couple of days here in Milwaukee and throughout the rest of the campaign. Yeah, we, we all know Donald Trump the fighter, but I think you're about to meet Donald Trump the healer um, tonight and in the days to come. Hey everyone, I'm Emily Campagno. Catch me and my co hosts Harris Faulkner and Kaylee McEnany on Outnumbered every weekday at 12 p.m. Eastern or set your DVR. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page for daily highlights.